All right, well, I want to welcome everyone to this week's meeting of the Northern New England chapter of the Society for American Baseball Research, always held in conjunction with the Gardner-Waterman chapter of Sabre. And I'm absolutely thrilled to say that our guest this evening is my longtime friend, Ted Noor. Ted has been a member of the Society for American Baseball Research since 1979 and a member of Sabre's Negro League Research Committee for over 30 years. He founded the Jerry Malloy Negro League Research Conference in 1998 and has hosted it four times in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Ted captured the individual significant contest three times at past Malloy conferences and will host that event for the 10th time in July in Detroit. Additionally, Ted became the only person to win both a Malloy significant contest and a Sabre national trivia title when 38 years after his first final four, his team, with little help from him, <laughs> won the Sabre team trivia title in 2022 in Baltimore. And I'm proud to say I was there. <laughs> of course, tonight's topic is the great right fielder, Rap Dixon. It's what Ted is probably best known for. Having made this presentation for 15 years now, he's promised us tonight to make this both fresh and compelling, just like he did when he first spoke on the man. Ted Knorr, thank, thank you, you Bruce. very much for doing this tonight. It's all yours, my friend. Okay, well, thanks for showing up, everybody. And I do see a few familiar names, but I also see a lot of unfamiliar names, and I'm happy to be talking to you guys uh, about a topic that I don't think is well known enough. And I don't mean just rap. I mean, Negro Leagues in general. And now that they are considered a major league, uh, I think we, we all need to be more familiar. And when I'm finished, I will be taking Q&A at the beginning on rap, of course, but on any subject in the Negro Leagues that you, you want to go to. So, Let's share my screen, and uh, I could do it moments ago. Let's see if I can do it now. Uh-oh. Aha. All right. Well, good to be here in New England. I, I wish I was because we have no snow here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, my topic, as Bruce said, is Rap Dixon, and I call this episode 44 uh, I'm not sure it's the 44th time I've given it, but I've been given it since 2007. To begin, the, this statement, uh, I really believe, uh, and I don't mean to compare us here with the victims of segregation uh, in the day, but we are the last victims of the segregation of baseball uh, prior to 47, because we don't know the Ty Cobbs and the Bay Bruce and the Dizzy Deans of the uh, of the Negro Leagues like we do in the majors. We and we certainly don't know the Germany Schaefers. But uh hopefully today I'll introduce us all to at least one uh person that we should know more about. Rap Dixon is born in Kingston, Georgia, September 15th, 1902. And I had the opportunity last year, and I hope to go back this year to speak in Kingston about uh, about Dixon. His father's name, John, his mother's Rose Goodwin Dixon. And between the two families, Dixon and Goodwins, they have three major league players. Herbert, that's Rap, Paul, who played under Rap uh, during his Negro League career, and then Tom Goodwin a 12- or 13-year veteran with the Dodgers and Cubs and the Lancaster Barnstormers. Uh, Tom is a uh, cousin. Uh, he's only one generation under rap. All right. The Dixon family, and you can see Georgia here, uh, the Dixon family came north, and they almost followed this arrow to central Pennsylvania. Uh and this was right before World War I, and this movement of six and a half million African Americans between World War I and 1970 is known as the Great Migration. And of course, they, they left the South and went all 
all over the country, usually following employment opportunities. And Stilton was no different. At the base of the hill in Stilton is the uh, Bethlehem Steel Plant, which was, when it opened, the first large-scale steel plant in the country and the first one to use the Bessemer, pro Bessemer proce uh, process. And this is at the base of a street called Adams Street, which runs up a hill from the Susquehanna River. Stilton, by the way, is right next to Harrisburg. Uh, Adams Street forms the core of the Black community of Steelton then and now. And this first house here is 137 Adams. And you could reach Rap by mail there between 1918 and 1944. Uh, now, he was playing baseball for much of that time and was not home uh, because baseball was a 7 to 12 month job and he also was married twice so he's not always physically there but the mail could find him there further up the street this is what brought the families to Steelton instead of Youngstown Ohio or Coatesville Pennsylvania they had the steel mill of course at the base of the hill but Rapp's uncle Oliver pastored First Baptist Church in Steelton from 1914 to the late 30s. So th this was a prominent Steelton family, not so much for the baseball, but uh, Reverend Goodwin was the first of his family to graduate from college. Further up the street, this is all on one street heading uphill, was a school called Hygienic School for Colored Youth. Now this, at least arguably, and in my opinion, was not segregated. This school, though, is all black, but it's a public school in Steelton. And uh, the kids, the African-American kids, could go to any school they wanted to, uh, with geographic limitations, of course. Uh, but uh, most African-Americans in this school was open until 1960. You know, they loved their hygienic school. And uh, one of the reasons was Dr. Howard, who was the founder and the headmaster at the school for probably a couple of decades. Okay, just two more vignettes before we get into the baseball. Uh, raps, uh, what do you call them when you're in school and it's you're not doing schoolwork? Uh, need, need help here. Uh, extracurriculars. Raps' extracurriculars were. Uh, Boxing, he boxed in things called smokers, uh, where men would go to be entertained in various fashions, one of which was boxing, and that's that's where Rap shined. He also played baseball with a semi-pro team from the age of 13 until we got into the professional ranks in the early 20s. Uh, he played football. And he also was second trumpet in a school combo. The last story of his childhood that I'll share, you can find in Phil Dixon's marvelous book on photographic history of the Negro Leagues. One day at school, probably 1922, Rapp is in science class, and they're about to dissect a cat. Up went Rapp's hand, and he, uh, Asked to be excused, but he walked right, right past the boys' room, out of the building, went to the bank, withdrew all his funds. He was already working uh, at the steel mill, and uh, he took a train probably just next door to Harrisburg because in 1922, he begins his career with the Harrisburg Giants, which leads me into his baseball career. I'm going to make an argument that I think justifies him being in the Hall of Fame. And what do you need to do to achieve that goal? You need to have stellar statistics. You need to have legends. And uh, legends similar to a Catholic wanting to be a saint, they need to have two miracles. Uh, yeah, I think you need to have more than two legends to become a baseball Hall of Famer. And lastly, 
You need opinions of your fellow players, your managers, the writers, and we'll get to all three of these. First, statistics. And every stat I mention will be from Steamhead's, Steamhead's Negro League database from 1886 through 1948. And the only filter I'm using is Negro League games only. And as you know, there wasn't a Negro League between 1886 and 1920. So it's Negro League teams or teams judged to be Negro League teams by the good folks at Seamheads. The only rival right now for Seamheads would be Baseball Reference. And they use the definition of Major League Baseball that, that Major League used on December 16th, 2020. So you will find different statistics in those two data sets, even though they both use seam heads statistics. Baseball reference just uses a subset of, of the, the, big, uh, the big set that seam heads has. Okay, who would you want to scout Rap Dixon in the winter of 25-26? I don't think he could do better than Muggsy McGraw one of the greatest assessors of baseball talent of his day, the winningest manager in the history of the National League. And he saw he saw uh, Dixon between the 25-26 California Winter League season. And this is what he had to say. This is the headline in the Harrisburg Telegraph. McGraw praises Herbert Dixon, that'd be rap, star outfielder. And if you go to the bottom here, his quote, which he gave the, uh, I assume, Harrisburg writer, he said, Dixon is, without question, one of the greatest outfielders in the United States. So let's take a quick look at who were the greatest outfielders, according to the Hall of Fame, in the U.S. at the time. There's 22 outfielders active in 1925. It's a bit of a bloated period for Hall of Famers. Uh and I don't think that should be held against the Negro Leagues. I, I think they need their fair share of that bloat. I, I'm not looking to remove uh, Sammy Rice or Tommy McCarthy or any of them. They're all Hall of Famers. They all belong. But there definitely needs to be more Negro League players. And I hope we get to that in my statement. These guys are in order of their OPS with the exception of the first three, Babe Ruth, Oscar Charleston, Ty Cobb, they're in my order. But from there on, you're looking at the OPS order, career OPS order for these 22 players. I suspect when McGraw says Dixon is one of the best outfielders, he probably had a number smaller than 22 in mind. I don't know. Okay. McGraw and other scouts, they look for five things. Can a player hit? Can he hit with power? Can he run? Can he catch? And can he throw? So we're going to look at Rap not through the scout's eyes, but through his career statistics and see how he ranks in these tools. Could he hit? Well, on this particular page, there are 54 Negro League players that bat as often as Rap did. And that's 2,548 plate appearances. Just by playing that many games or more, you have a 25% chance of being in the Hall, as 14 of those 54 players are in the Hall of Fame, and then there's 40, including Rap, that aren't. But let's see how well he hits. His OPS is 944. That is higher than all 40 that aren't in the hall. So nobody has a higher OPS in the Negro League database than Rap Dixon that isn't in the hall. And you'll notice 57% of those 14, eight of the 14 Hall of Famers, Rap out hits. Same thing for OPS plus and same thing for runs created per 27. So I think he could hit and I think he could hit with the best of them. Could he hit with power? This is one of his strengths. I mean, hitting is a strength too, but you'll see, especially when we look at the Hall of Famers, here his numbers are even better. He's got the highest slugging average 
of anybody not in the hall that bats 25, 48 times or more in Major League Baseball history. He's at just ahead of uh, Lefty Duel in this instance. For players who played in the segregated era, now I'm, I'm limiting my view to the era before Jackie. His homers per 162, 21. There's no Negro League player with more that's not in the hall. And his total bases would be 313 for an average 162-game season. I think he could hit with power. Running's a little more difficult to assess, and I don't pretend that that my method is the best, or even if it's very good. It's what, it's what I use. Uh, I look at runs, steals, and triples, all three of which are affected by speed, uh, some more than others. Many who use something similar don't count their home runs in runs because that's a double count, but uh, I didn't go that far. And you'll notice among the 40 non-Hall of Famers, he does have some guys ahead of him in each of these categories. But if you add the three ranks, and I think it was second, fourth, and sixth, Nobody has a lower number of ranks that's not in the hall uh, among Negro Leaguers. And there's only two Hall of Famers, Negro League Hall of Famers, that are faster than rap, according to this view. And that would be Oscar Charleston and Cool Papa Bell. Finally, and this is a separator, there are a lot of guys that have great offense there's very few that can add fielding to their resume. There's three outfield positions, left field, center field, and right field. And there's three metrics in the Seamheads database, fielding percentage, range factor, and run saved by arm. There's 800 outfielders that play 10 or more games in the Seamheads database. There's only one of those 800 that's better than average in left, center, and right, in fielding percentage range and arm. I think he could field. And then finally, his best uh, characteristic, his best strength, his best tool, if you add runs saved by arm in left, center, and right, for all those outfielders, rap is number one. So now let's take another look at the 22, now 23, greatest outfielders of 1925. I've inserted Rapp where his OPS merits him. Uh, the seven ahead of him, I think without question, are, are more deserving, uh, better outfielders. And you'll notice that includes three Negro leaguers, Oscar Charleston, Turkey Stearns, and oh, four Negro leaguers, Pete Hill and Cristobal Torriente. And the other 15 are Hall of Famers, and I think Rapp's better than all of them. I, I would not dare to compare him to a single player or two single players. That, that's not the way you judge a Hall of Famer. But I'm saying here, in my opinion, Rapp is a definite deserving Hall of Famer. All right, legends. And here I'm going to just read his legends because – this is what my presentation usually focuses on, and I, I I could spend the entire 35 minutes on legends alone, and I don't want to do that. So let me just read and scroll through these. I think this outfield that's behind me, they have lockers behind me. Fats Jenkins in left field down here, Oscar Charleston in center field, and then Rap Dixon in right. This was the outfield of the Harrisburg Giants between 1924 and 1927. It's clearly the greatest outfield in the Negro Leagues. And the, why I can say that is this is the only outfield where all three outfielders are in the top dozen outfielders listed by the Hall. They're either in the Hall, there are seven and we'll meet them, or they're on the ballot and there's five of them. This is the only outfield in Negro League Baseball that has three outfielders from that group, and they're intact for a four-year period. There's only a there's less than 25 outfields in baseball history that are intact for a four or more year period that includes a Hall of Famer. 
Charleston is the Hall of Famer in this bunch. And Fats Jenkins is in Springfield, Mass. He's a Hall of Famer in that sport. Okay. In 1927, Rap goes to Japan with his winter league team, the Philadelphia Royal Giants. And they include Hall of Famer Biz Mackey and Hall of Famer Andy Cooper. Rap displayed all five of his tools as they toured Japan. He uh, used to stand on home plate and pitch balls over distant fences, as you can see here in this cartoon. Uh, this cartoon was sent to me by Kaz Sayama, who's a Japanese baseball historian. He also ran the bases in 14.2 seconds, which is flying even today. Uh, it's not 12 seconds like they say Cool Papa Bell did, but uh, I don't believe that. But I do believe 14.2 for, for Rap Dixon. He hit the longest home run in Koshien Stadium. Uh, I shouldn't say home run. It was a triple but no one had ever left the ballpark where his ball hit the fence and they marked the fence where it hit. And that, that mark lasted until the stadium was torn down. Uh, he also uh, made many catches that were mentioned in the newspaper for, for their acrobatic nature. He stole, led the team in stolen bases, hit about 400, uh, won a game pitching in Korea. And, uh, when he came back to Hawaii, he did much the same thing. And you also find his five tools commemorated in the Hawaiian paper. This picture here shows Emperor Hirohito providing him with a loving cup trophy because of his prowess on the field. This is somewhat apocryphal. Uh, there's no photographic evidence of this. There is evidence of that trophy in a team panorama but that's a team trophy. Uh, uh, all I'm saying here is there is mention in at least two sources that Hirohito gave Dixon such a trophy. And I know of two people who have told me they've seen the trophy in the family. Uh, and any questions you have, please, you know, fire away when we get there. In 1929, Rap cracked 14 consecutive hits. And this was in the Negro, the American Negro League which is now considered a major league. So this may well be the major league record for consecutive hits. And I will, I want to just take a quick look at the current holders of that record, Johnny Kling, Pinky Higgins, and Walt Dropo. You'll notice I've listed here how many hits in a row they had. Clearly, Dixon's 14, if you accept the pitching as equivalent, uh, is the new record. But let's look at the pitching. The ERA plus of Kling's 12 pitchers is 106. The ERA plus, according to Seamheads, of Dixon's 12, 14 is 113. So he pitched against or hit against better pitching. Three Hall of Famers, that's one pitcher, but three of Dixon's hits were off Smokey Joe Williams. None of the other three got any hits in their streak off Hall of Famers. And 11 of the 14 pitchers that Dixon faced had a 100 or better ERA plus. And any questions you want to have on the, on the merit of the Negro leagues vis-a-vis -vis, uh, major league baseball, let's have that discussion. Uh, turned out he walked twice in the streak and that does set a new major league record, modern uh, piggy word actually had 17 straight back in the 1890s. But uh, Ted Williams got 16 straight in 57. So Dixon and Williams have the modern major league record for consecutive reaches. And one little final panel on the record on this 14 straight. Uh, and I was at sea in 19, in 2015. No, earlier. And uh, I did a presentation on Dixon and uh, in the audience, and I'm not going to remember his name, but it's the only living member from the original Sabre founders, uh, Hufford. Tom Hufford was in my audience. I was thrilled. And uh, this was one of the panels I used there because I want to point out Gehrig held his record for 62 years consecutive games played. DiMaggio's, his record is 82 years old. 
The last 400 hitters, Ted, Teddy Ball game, that's an 82-year-old record. Now, we may find as soon as Major League Baseball fully incorporates the Negro League statistics, uh, Artie Wilson hits 400 in 1948. And so he may well be the last Major League 400 hitter. However, Williams is Williams bats 604 times and Artie Wilson bats under 200. So they're really not comparable, except in a technical sense. But finally, Rap Dixon has held this record now, a Negro League record, and hopefully a Major League record, for 94 years. All right. In 1930, well, in 1923, Babe Ruth hits the first home run in Yankee Stadium. And, of course, it's been called the house that Ruth built ever since. Seven years later, in the very first game that Negro Leagues play in Yankee Stadium, who do you think hits the first home run as an African-American in Yankee Stadium? Rap Dixon. And he hit three that day in a doubleheader. And uh, I call it the house that Dixon rehabbed. In 1932, Rap Dixon is the last piece of the puzzle for the first great Pittsburgh Crawford team. This is the Hall of Fame manager, Oscar Charleston. He also played first base for the team. Over here is Hall of Famer Judd Wilson, Hall of Famer Judy Johnson, and Hall of Famer Josh Gibson. This is the only one in the picture who's not in the hall, and that's, of course, Rap Dixon. The very first uh, Negro League All-Star game. This is a, a, a newspaper picture. This is Dixon batting and uh, the great catcher, Larry Brown. It's in Comiskey Park, as you can see. Uh, Rapp was elected to that game by the fans, and he was an All-Star eight times in newspaper All-Star games because by 1933, his career is almost over. 1934, he plays in the winter, after the Winter League. He led the Puerto Rican League in steals, and then he played for a team out of Venezuela called Concordia. Pretty good team. Here's Josh Gibson. This is Martin Diego. They're both Hall of Famers. This is a Hall of Famers father. This is Louis Aparicio Sr. And then, of course, in the middle, Rap Dixon. He hit 398 for that team. In 1934, all right, so that Concordia was early in 34. Turns out Rapp hurt his back terribly at the end of that uh, winter season, and he only plays in nine games in 34, but he's the manager of the Baltimore Black Sox, and he's the first professional manager for Leon Day, who goes on to the Hall of Fame. And Leon himself told me Rapp was the right man for the job. 1935, this will be his swan song as a player. The Pittsburgh Crawfords captured the first half title and the New York Cubans the second half title. The Cubans were led in the second half of that season by a new acquisition named Rap Dixon. And this is what Dixon does in that, that seven-game playoff. Four Hall of Famers were in that series. And Rap out hit them all in average on base percentage and OPS. Uh, Oscar Charleston does out slug them. And unfortunately, Rap's team had a three game to one lead and uh, lost it in seven games. All right. Here's another place where feel free to ask questions because I'm I'm talking on the legendary side and I believe this to be true. But in 1937, Cool Papa Bell, Josh Gibson, Satchel Page, Chet Brewer, George Gales, I think, they all go to play in the Summer League for the Dictator Trio in the Dominican Republic. And, of course, that team wins the championship, thank God, because they were actually under mili military uh control. Uh they, they were they they really needed to win that series. And of course. They they did. Dixon wasn't there, but when they come north, they're all suspended, with the exception of Gibson, from the Negro Leagues because they jumped their contracts. They probably made more playing for Torrio in a short uh, time than they would have in the whole season in the Negro Leagues. But now they need a manager, 
and they hire Rap Dixon, and he coaches this team as a barnstorming team, not without Gibson. Gibson's back with the Grays, but Page and Brewer and Scales and Cool Papa Bell, they win the Denver Post tournament uh, with Dixon as their manager. And, you know, I'd, I'd appreciate a question on that, actually. All right, 1942, Dixon manages a team of uh, an integrated Harrisburg Giant team. They play Hilldale, and they had four white guys on the team. And Dixon was quite vociferous in the newspapers about coming integration. That's the legends, and that's that's a handful. I'm going to wrap here with the opinions. Uh and that's this is this is what makes this presentation different than any that I've done except for the last time. This is the second time I'm I'm doing it in this fashion. According to the Hall of Fame, there's seven in the hall, and I'm going to read their names. Monty Irvin, these are outfielders, Cool Papa Bell, Oscar Charleston, and they were the only three for almost 25 years. Then Turkey Stearns, Pete Hill, Cristobal Torriente, and Willard Brown. They're the seven greatest Negro League outfielders, according to Cooperstown. I don't know how you can interpret that any other way. There's five more on 2006 ballot, and there was one ballot since then in 2021, and that did not include any additional outfielders. It did include Vic Harris, who is a borderline Hall of Famer in the outfield, but he's on that ballot because he's maybe the greatest manager, certainly one of them, in Negro League history. All right, some other opinions. In 1952, the Pittsburgh Courier, which is a black newspaper, they got a panel together of 31 writers, players, managers, and they named a first team, a second team, third, fourth, and fifth team uh of Negro League players. This this took place in 52, so the Negro Leagues had pretty much been out of business, although they continue on to 61 with only four teams in the Negro American League. But you can see here, only Chino Smith and Clint Thomas get picked ahead of rap in this poll. 50, 66 years later, uh, Bob Kendrick, the president of the Negro League Baseball Museum, announces the Centennial team. This is in 2018, December, gearing up for the uh, Centennial in 2020, which unfortunately never really got properly celebrated because of COVID. But four, there are 32 players named to this Centennial team. Of them, only four weren't in the hall, and since 2018, Buck O'Neill has been named to the Hall. So there's three players, two pitchers, Dick Redding and John Donaldson, and the outfielder, Rap Dixon. Dixon being the only position player on the centennial team yet to be inducted. Hmm. Moving right along, Sabres Negro League Committee. Under Larry Lester's guidance, uh, we voted for 101 Negro League notables, because in 2021, when this was held, uh, it was the 101st anniversary. Uh, 2020 might have been a bit of a dud, but we tried to liven up 2021. And this is the top 10 players in that poll in terms of the, of the non-Hall of Famers. And Dixon is number two, tied with Dick Redding behind the great Dick Lundy. Here's another poll, 42 for 21 poll. This was later in 2021, and this poll was organized by Gary Gillette, Sean Gibson, that's Josh's great-grandson. Is it? Yeah, I think he's the great. He might just be a grandson, and, and myself. And you see Rap Top, this poll also, uh, he, he was deemed the most worthy non-Hall of Fame candidate for the Hall. To wrap, we're going to go back to those seven Hall of Famers, seven Negro League Hall of Famers. If I could go in a time machine, I would like to know what those first three, who were the only Hall of Famers for 25 years in the outfield from the Negro Leagues, who do they think is the most deserving outfielder for the Hall of Fame? Monty Irvin comes first. This is from a 1996 autobiography of Monty, written by himself, 
and James A. Riley. And he ranks outfielders, as you can see. These are the eight outfielders that he ranks as the eight best in order. Oscar Charleston, Cool Papa Bell. They were the only two in 1996 Hall of Fame outfielders other than Monty himself. And then he's prescient, and he names Stearns next, and Stearns went in three years later. And then his good friend and contemporary Wild Bill Wright, and then Rap. So Monty is saying that Rap is the second most deserving outfielder not yet inducted. What does cool Papa Bell think? Well, he's a little slick here. Despite the presence of Buck Leonard, he puts Charleston at first, and this enables him to name three outfielders. Charleston, most people consider him a center fielder, and of course he was until he got a little heavy and aged to, to patrol that that uh, center center field. But uh, Bell, he, he, Bell tells Donald Dewey, who wrote a book called The Greatest Team in 1994, that he thinks the three greatest outfielders he ever saw were Turkey Stearns, Monty Irvin, all of them are Hall of Famers, and Rap Dixon. So Bell is saying in 1994, Rap Dixon is the most deserving outfielder not in the Hall. For me, it's important to note that Irvin and Bell were alive when they were inducted into the Hall, and that was part of why they got inducted. Uh, about half of those first nine in are alive. Uh, Oscar Charleston is the first deceased outfielder inducted into the Hall of Fame. To me, that's a recognition, and most people agree with this. Oscar Charleston is the greatest of all Negro League outfielders. In 1949, so he's not influenced as Irvin and Bell may have been by the Hall of Fame or even the 52 Courier poll. This is Charleston's opinion given to the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin on who the three greatest outfielders were that he ever saw. In left field, the great Afro-Cuban Martin Diego. In right field, another Afro-Cuban, Cristobal Torriente. And in center field, his old position, he puts Rap Dixon. And throughout Charleston's career, he continually hammered home that point First, by coming to Harrisburg in 1924, he came because of the owner's money and because the owner let him manage. He came because he married a Harrisburg girl two years earlier, but he also came because he knew he was going to be between Fats Jenkins and left and Rap Dixon and right. So this isn't a one-time thing that Charleston is saying. And in 1933, it's important to point out 1934. Charleston in Pittsburgh with the Crawfords offers straight up cool Papa Bell to Philadelphia for Rap Dixon. And that's a great honor right there. However, here's what Philadelphia said. They said, well, we'll keep Dixon. In other words, we, we like Dixon better than Bell. But how about giving us your 22-year-old catcher, Josh Gibson? So that uh, putting Dixon Somewhere higher than Bell and not quite Gibson is quite a tribute from Charleston and the Philadelphia Stars. Okay, one final comment, and then the, it's your turn for Q&A. There are 48 outfielders in the Baseball Hall of Fame whose career began under segregation. Of them, only seven are Negro Leaguers. Uh, I don't dispute those 41 white Hall of Famers. Uh, it would be anathema to me to remove any of them. However, and they are a little bloated. You know, there's there's more of them than you'll see since the integration. Uh, there needs to be more Negro League outfielders. There's only 14% of the outfielders prior to integration that are outfielders of color. Since Jackie crossed that line, 27 players have become Hall of Famers by outfield play. I'm including Baines here because there was no designated hitter in place for, uh, for outfielders or first basemen prior to uh, the modern day. But 78% of all outfielders 
are outfielders of color since 1947. It would take 135 more Negro League outfielders to make those percentages match. I'm not saying that. I am saying more Negro League outfielders, more Negro League players, but outfielders, is my concern, need to be inducted. And I suggest 14 because there's seven in now, and if you'd put 14 more in, the percentage would still only be 34%, less than half the percentage earned since 47. But 21 has a bit of a ring to it. That would match the total number of outfielders of color who have uh, who have made the hall since 1947. Time's yours. I hope we have some questions. Everyone can unmute and ask their questions. Just jump right in, folks. Ted's here to answer anything you'd like to uh, throw at him regarding RAP or the Negro Leagues. Uh, I just to say oh, great presentation, sorry. Ted. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was awesome. fascinating history. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Uh, I have a question. This is Sean Moore. I'm a new Sabre member. Thanks for Hi, Sean. this. Um, yeah, so uh, so Ted, you made a very convincing case for Rap Dixon to be in the Hall of Fame. Is there any existing vehicle for him to get in, like a Negro League committee or anything? Yes. Uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame has been changing their, their rules quite often in the past uh, 15 years. Between 2006 and 2021, there was no method to get in. The, the doors were effectively closed, although uh, the hall would tell you if new information is found, we can, you know, consider additional Negro leaders. But in 2021, you, you, you will note uh, Buck O'Neill and Bud Fowler were named as Hall of Famers mm -hmm. via the normal vet committee uh, method. And Minnie Minoso, a former third baseman in the Negro Leagues, went in in the same panel that denied Dick Allen by a vote. Oh, so yeah. that was the situation just two years ago. The next time they'll be up. Now, this is a sin, though. Let me. Thanks for the question, Sean. Uh, th this, this needs to be changed. Uh, right now, the committee that's going to vote on Negro Leaguers in December of 24 is going to be 16 people. Uh, I got to give the hall credit. They had, I want to say, five Negro League authorities on their panel three years ago that resulted in Buck and Bud going in. But that's not enough. I mean, because the ballot Two issues. There has to be a voting panel, in my opinion, that's Negro League expertise. And there needs to be a ballot. Again, this is just my opinion, and obviously it's debatable. Uh, these are folks who were punished by segregation during their baseball careers, and now they're being punished by integration because the ballot that they're going to be on in December of 24 includes major league players through 1980, how are players who haven't played since 48 at the latest, how can they compete with Dick Allen, who, who you know, obviously is overdue? Uh, so that's the situation right now. But uh, they do need to have a special dedicated committee, just like 2006, and a special ballot and also – there cannot be restrictions on how many you can vote for. If, if you're a Hall of Famer, you should be voted in. If you're not, you should be bypassed. Thanks. Sean Moore coming in hot with his first question here. That was terrific, Sean. Good work. Uh, <laughs> uh, Susan had her hand up, and so does James. So I saw Susan first. I may be wrong. I don't know. Uh, Susan, go ahead. Yeah, I was interested in that trip to Japan. What year was that? And um, I'm assuming it's in the 20s. Yes. And at the time, did the Japanese have established leagues and play? Um, okay. Their... 
it was 1927 and it's uh i want to say it was late march when they left they had played the winter season in california uh the japanese did have baseball now the league wasn't formed until the year after babe was there in 35 i think 36 is the first year i could be wrong about that but it's in that vicinity but the trip in 27 they they did play teams throughout japan and korea and uh they they only lost one game although that was rectified and i'd like to talk about that loss in in a second but the league wasn't there yet but this trip they again they lost one game and that was changed to a tie and I'll, I'll I'll address that momentarily. But the sportsmanship that these guys, the book that covers that, and make a note if you're interested, it's called Gentle Black Giants. And it's a new book, maybe three years old. It's written in Japanese 30 years ago, finally translated to, to us. Uh, it credits that, that trip in 27. You know, the Ruth tour is what sells the Japanese on forming their Nippon Baseball League, which is their still there, still their, their major league. But the seeds were sown in 27, because unlike Ruth and Gehrig in 35, which ran up scores, I mean, they could win 19 to 2 and think nothing of it. The Negro League teams, they won by much lower scores, despite having, in my opinion, an equal an equal team. Uh, I'd love to have seen that team play the Ruth team, but uh, they they didn't run scores up and they didn't argue. Here's their only loss. Imagine this: it's a one nothing ball game, bo uh, the bottom or I guess it would be the top of the ninth. Runners are on. Well, there's a runner on first. It happens to be Rap Dixon, and he gets singled the third. So now it's first and third. There are one out. The next batter flies to right for the second out. Dixon tags and scores the game tying run. But the runner on first base is goofing around. I don't know what he was doing, but he eventually is tagged out before he, you know, he, he left first base properly, but he's out at second. And the umpire called it a one nothing win for the Japanese team. That was their only loss. But both the Japanese team and, and of course, the, the Negro Leaguers didn't complain. But it was eventually determined that uh, that, that run should have scored, should have counted. And the game then would have went in to the bottom of the ninth and probably maybe extras. But that was their only loss, and they, they did not argue that. James. Great. Uh, Ted, one comment and two questions. Comment, fantastic presentation. Uh, you make a great litigator. I thought that your your evidence that you put into play, it was just, and especially your presentation, is very powerful. My two questions um, are, number one, do you know of any pictures that show that Harrisburg outfield, though all three outfielders oh. together? And my second question, <laughs> my second question is, about that special committee from 2006, from what I guess I've learned, there's a fair amount of secrecy about that, but do you know if RAP came up and was there a discussion? How did he fare during that process? Yes. Okay, boy, that, that's a bunch of questions here. Let's talk about the picture first, because there's an artist in the room somewhere, I think, uh, Elizabeth England. I hope she's still here. She's working on a, uh, a picture of that outfield. So your point is well taken. There, there she is. Yeah. Good to see you, Beth. Uh, there, there is no picture of that outfield. But Beth is working from pictures of various uh, juxtapositions of outfielders, including Jenkins and Charleston in the same picture. Uh, and, um, you know, anxiously, she hasn't quite begun yet, but she'll be. Do you want to say anything about the picture, Beth? Well, it'll be later this week, and um, I've been working back and forth with Ted. He's given me various images, some that he showed during the presentation, and I'm piecing, I think, three different things together. I have, um, boy, where are they? One second. 
Okay. And while she's doing that, let me share my screen again. Although I, I don't want to. <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Let's get back to. So uh, I don't that. know if, if everybody can see this, but. Oh, wow. Look at that. So this is what I've superimposed and we're back and forth. Um, the uh, Harrisburg Giants played because I live in Williamsport, <laughs> but they played their first game, correct, Lou? Or yep. Lou, oh, Lou here? At, no, Lou's not here. Um, at at uh, this stadium in Williamsport, uh, the Crosscutter Stadium, Bowman Field. So I was going to put this. We have a picture of the outfield. And this is where Rap Dixon hit his first home run, right? Uh, Oscar Charleston hit the oh, first I, home run in okay, Bowman sorry. Field. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So anyway, we were going to use this field, but if Ted could give me a field of that uh, picture of the outfield from 1926, I've been the actual outfield in Harrisburg. I've been trying to find it, but we don't really, we have the grandstand in the background, but not the actual field. Okay, James, uh, in back to 2006, you're exactly right. There, no one you hear often. Oh, uh, Buck O'Neill missed by one vote or spots. It, to the best of my knowledge, and I was very close to that process. I wasn't one of the voters, but uh, I was in the next room and I was advising them. Uh, uh, not that anybody was listening, but. Uh, that no one knows the results of any of those votes other than the 17 that were voted in all got 75% or more. And that's it. They, they did a very good job of maintaining secrecy there. Rap was certainly one of the 39 on that ballot, and he failed to get 75%. Thank you. Go to bed. Oh, I'm going to share my screen while we do Q&A because uh, okay. James asked about pictures and I, I actually have pictures to scroll through while while questions are answered. Okay, so I just shared something in the chat. It's this uh, Nichi VAQ U.S. Tours of Japan, Volume 1. Uh, and I shared that in the chat because it, after hearing your presentation, Ted, um, made me think of this book, which I've yet to read. Because as I uh, dropped in the chat, I'm still trying to get through the cavernous uh, Shy Park <laughs> Sabres <laughs> publication that I was gifted. That's a big book. Actually sent to you by a friend who's a Sabre member. But uh, I just wanted your comment on that book, Ted, if you had seen that book or had chance. Who's to the it. author? Um, I shared it in the chat. It said, uh, edited by Robert K. Fitz, Bill Nolan, and James oh, Forrest. Yes. That's one of right. our he, latest thoughts. Yep. When you made reference to, so comment for you and then. That was my comment. Yeah. And then my question or query was, I'm assuming that's going to be in that book because of the, the tour that you referenced uh, yeah. rap taking in to Japan around that time. Yeah, the, I'm okay. sure the 27 tour is in the book. I haven't okay. seen the book. Robert Fitz is preeminent among the uh, American scholars on the topic. Uh, right. he, he will call me to task for... Right. Uh, insinuating that Hirohito gave Dixon the trophy. Right. Uh, so that's not, yeah, that's a matter of speculation. Yes, yes. A, a, a bit of like uh, romanticizing, I guess. Yes. Although the trophy exists, and let me just tell you, because here's two, his grandniece who was invited to this presentation, I don't see her, but she saw the trophy in their family. It, it remained in the Dixon family in her eyes. I mean, this is, you know, this is her version. And she saw it. Another guy who played baseball for rap around 1940, a guy named Syke Burnett, he saw the trophy too. Now he tells a different story. It's not a loving cup trophy as I displayed. It's a baseball player statuette encumbered with jewels like only an emperor could do. So there's another eyewitness, I have two, that have seen the trophy that Hirohito gave rap. Now, oral history is good for much, but accuracy is an, another story. I, I don't pretend to know anything that no one else does. 
So it's kind of a holy grail situation, it sounds like. Exactly. Okay. Go to Sean. That's a great picture. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, this is a great picture. Oh. And uh, Phil Dewey did this one, and he changed. It's really oh. a Hilldale Giants team picture, and he was nice enough to change it to Harrisburg Giants. Oh, oh, this is nice. All right, Sean, you're up. Uh, I just wanted to comment. Um, so, Rap Dixon at some point was with the Baltimore Black Sox. So, I forgot to wear my Baltimore Black Sox hat that my <laughs> wife gave to me for my birthday this year. So, this is very it. cool. Yeah. Thank yep. you. Rap was with them for several years, including when he got the 14 straight hits. And when he hit the first home run by an African American in Yankee Stadium. Fantastic. Thank you. Tim Brennan, you're up. Hey, uh, thanks for organizing this. And uh, Ted, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm a I'm a big, big Rap Dixon fan, and I, I love the stories you're sharing. Hey, I, I think one of the ways in which uh some of these uh long gone uh Negro League players become more real to people is when we can kind of connect them to more contemporary players, like uh, compare them. I had a great animated chat in the background while you're presenting about some of his contemporaries uh, in the twenties, uh, you know, folks like Kiki Kyler and such might've been really close, close comparables, but yep. um, who would you say, I don't know, looking around on the screen here, there's a fair amount of gray hair. Uh, who would you say would be uh, someone from the 70s or the 80s, uh, 90s maybe, that uh, Rap Dixon might be really comparable to? Well, no one. Uh, the, the one that I've always liked is Andre Dawson uh -huh. because he has an arm and uh, and power, and, and he could run. Now, he didn't steal as many as, as Rap did, but... Uh, uh, Andre Dawson has always been the one that, that I see, and his average doesn't match raps. And one comment I wanted to make, and again, this is probative of nothing, but the Negro Leagues and the Major Leagues have virtually identical batting averages between 1920 and 1948. And again, there are minor leagues that match up very nicely with Major League from time to time, usually the higher up you go, the lower the batting averages, but that's not always true. But the fact that their slash lines are almost identical, it means to me that when you say Rap is a 325 hitter as he was, that's what his major league equivalent is, not 288. Uh, so that's, I, I just wanted to present that for folks as they try to translate from one to another. Donna. Hello. So Hello. Ted, thanks for another great mm -hmm. uh, Rap Dixon presentation. I was wondering if anybody from the group that's organizing the Negro Leagues Museum at Hinchliffe Stadium has been in touch with you about making sure that Rap is adequately represented there. No, but of course I know those folks, and and maybe I maybe I need to get in touch with them. Uh, Hinchcliffe, I'm not sure. You know, I don't know the history of that stadium well enough. Rap does play for the New York Cubans, and I think they played in Hinchcliffe. They, they played Hinchcliffe for in '35 and '36. Well, there you go. <laughs> so I get, thank you, Donna. You so I, I must do that. You're exactly right. Okay. I assume I assume one of those seven playoff games probably took place in Hinchcliffe. Would be, I would assume that. Thank well, I'll, you. I'll, I'll email you and maybe we, we can figure out. Yes, the, yes, because we'll, we'll talk we, more offline. We have communicated before. Uh, yes, Donna. Thank you very much. Oh, what else do we have for Ted tonight? Anything else? I have a question. Go ahead, Mal. Um, it's not something you necessarily touched on, Ted, but just a curiosity. How did he come by the name of Rap? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Good question. Thank you. Uh, there are two versions in James Riley's biography in his biographical encyclopedia. He maintains 
that it was because of the uh, Rappahannock River, which if you remember the diagram I showed coming from Georgia to central PA, that takes you right across. And this river is thing because it's a tidal river. It's salt water. So that would get a young boy's attention. And uh, according to Riley, Rap had an affinity or something with that river, and that's where he got the name. Chez Washington in the Pittsburgh Courier gives a much more plausible explanation. And that was it was in high school when, of course, he's playing for a semi-pro team. Uh, the way he wrapped the ball is how he got the nickname. So take your pick. Uh, they both have a certain romance. And, the, and they both are a little more magical than Herbert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ted. You're welcome, Molly. Thank you. All right. Well, this has been terrific. Hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. sure. Yes. Thank Sweet. you. Amen. Stop a sharing. Well, this has been a fa fantastic presentation, Ted. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a little round of applause for Ted. How about that, huh? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, for Ted, are you, uh, Very Ted, good. Are you, um, are you going to present at Sabre 51 this year in Chicago? Did you apply? No, and and I, I did do the outfield that we spoke of in right. Sabre whatever back in uh, uh, Louisville in the late 90s. Okay. I, I did a presentation on the outfield, and I've done raps rap at several Malloy conferences. Uh, um, right, because it's different. But okay, I was no, I, I won't be it. doing it in Chicago. Thanks. All right, everybody. Well, join us next week when we have uh, Sam Bernstein here to give us his presentation, Home Run, A History of the Long Ball. Sam oh. will explore the fascination of the home run by looking at the sluggers who made the long ball popular. The program will track rule changes, baseball manufacturing, and other factors that led to an explosion of four baggers beginning in the 1920s. I think that's going to be a really great presentation to hear. I'm, I'm going to bet it's going to rival Ted tonight because mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. we only have the greatest stuff up here, let me tell you. <laughs> but well, I want to thank Ted. Ted, I've known you now for decades. And this is actually the first time I've seen your presentation. Shame on me. Uh, that and that was great. terrific stuff. I'm honored to have you in tonight. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming and hope we're going to see everybody next week for mm -hmm. Sam Bernstein. Mm -hmm. That's it. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.